pregnancy related products. And uh, they apologize. And a few days later, the call center then again calls to check if everything is fine. Uh, and then the guy, the guy sheepishly admits that the teenage daughter is actually pregnant. So that's uh, that's uh, that's how powerful uh, uh, data can be. I mean, if you mine the appropriate, we look for the appropriate signals. It it can uh, it can be good. So machine learning is getting into all all almost all the domains that you can think of. So if if you take a particular company. Uh, in a particular division can have uh, can do analytics, you can have marketing, human resource, supply chain, they all use <coughs> machine learning algorithms. And uh, uh, in any industry that you think of, if it, I can't think of any industry which doesn't use machine learning. It's, uh, it's becoming uh, uh, all pervasive. So I, I would want uh, you people to give some examples of what you think uh, places where machine learning has to play a part. You know? uh, just, just to ensure that you start thinking along where it can be applied. You can start from somewhere here. I mean, you can pick a, a division, you can pick an industry and think of all problems they face. I work for Symantec and we are in the security business. So identification of threat is very critical, particularly if you have to do it in real time. And there are too many, uh, too many data points you have to look at to identify a threat. Uh, the whole threat identification itself is a quite complex machine learning problem, which itself will not be answered. So threat identification, security threat identification is, is a problem. Right. I mean, the examples. Well, education is not there. But I think educational data mining has come up in a very big way. Okay. So, so which is what we are about. Uh, so which is my, what my company is all about. Okay. So we provide uh, educational data analytics to bachelor students. So we can uh, what do they do. So and we can predict a uh, lot about them, about their style of taking exams, uh, what kind of students they are, how they can improve themselves. Uh, I have actually worked with the Swiss company. So, uh, we were working on a project uh, where we uh, predicted uh, from, you know, we get a lot of data from sensors of the uh, aeroplane and we predicted that uh, when, uh, what, will, what will be the age of uh, a part, when can that part uh, need a repair or when will that part fail. So, those kind of predictions uh, we use. Okay. So, you, know, you can get a sense of the different kinds of things. Um, let me tell. So, human resources. The way they can do is uh, when will uh, guy resign? Like, can we predict even before uh, he resigns? Telling can we create a model which identifies that he is going to resign three months back and start uh, managing him better? Uh, so that's uh, that's that's one option which uh, human resources can do. Marketing. So we all get emails and uh, SMS with. By real estate, by uh, this, by car, someone will call and tell we want a loan. So, so most of these things, uh, at least uh, in developed economies, they're all done using machine learning algorithms. They try to identify people who would be willing to buy a particular product, who are more likely to buy a particular product, and then the campaigns are targeted for uh, for those kind of people. So it's it's helped in. Uh, it helps in uh, designing your advertisements, your marketing campaigns. Uh, those are things where it's it's, it's highly relevant. Uh, <coughs> when you do when you when you type on Google, some ads come on the right. That's uh, that's a machine learning algorithm in, in at work. Uh, supply chain. What's the short, shortest path to reach a particular customer? Where to set up warehouses? Uh, these are all examples of how uh, you could do supply chain. Legal, that sounds very weird. What kind of stuff can be done in legal? Replace the parallel goals. <laughs> uh, so, so one, of, one of the places where uh, uh, where it's, it's coming uh, up a lot in legal, is, some people are talking about text mining. So, so take past information, historical information of how cases have gone and then they try to predict that if such a case come, what should be the judgment? It helps in, in, the, in the lawyers and the judges to provide uh, better results based on historical information. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, healthcare. 
what kind of stuff can be done with it? Yeah, you can tell if someone has a cancer or not. You can look into the data and you can tell if someone has a cancer or not. Automatic identification. So you have all these semi fMRI data. There's been a lot of work going on in automatic identification diagnosis from from the MRI uh, scans even before it goes to a specialist who can write the report. So can the machine replicate what what goes on in the process? In case of finance, so products, products, basically, like you have like a repository of insurance for claims that get classified as fraud or not. Yes. Based on that, I think okay, when a new claim comes, would it be a fraud? Yes, definitely. That's something which which all companies do. If something, anyone, anyone. Uh, any bank which issues a credit card will have a fraud uh, fraud algorithm which tells based on uh, the different sequences of uh, transactions that happen if the fraud is happening or not. So that's something that that's really widespread. Gene sequencing, trying to find what the optimal gene sequences could be. This one. Energy. Energy is becoming huge these days. Uh, so, a lot of companies are trying to predict what will be the, uh, they're trying to forecast what the energy requirements would be and how to go about setting up the infrastructure for that. Uh, it's being widely done in, in, in a few countries. Sports, what can be done in sports? Okay. For the fixed matches better. <laughs> Germany took the advantage of the big data processing and uh, Coming up with the strategy, they also found out that in probability of scoring a goal, that from 17 minutes at 10 to 83 minutes are more than any other. <coughs> so, few of the analysis that they have done to come up with. Yeah. Analytics, right? Ball shot, which ball to Raina. So, something <laughs> like that. Um, so, that's that's something it's, uh, it's very lucrative in the US to do analytics. Uh, Moneyball, you may have all heard about the book or watched the movie. Uh, if you haven't, you should watch it. Uh, that movie uses a lot of uh, analytics to identify players, uh, uh, create uh, uh, smart people with less value, and then try to make a winning team. So these are uh, different examples of how. Uh, what are things that can be done? One common theme that that we talked about in all the places was that. You need a lot of data before, right? I mean, you have historically we talked about medical stuff, we talked about legal, we talked about software threat for anything. You need to know historically what happened. You need to have past data and you need to know what happened because of that. So when you have all this information, you can you can build you can use this data to build predictive models. So the two two kinds of broad classifications. And there's like many things, but two things that I want to differentiate is classification versus regression. Uh, can someone tell what the difference between classification and regression is? Classification is like discrete values, but regression is a Yes. So classification is when you want to bucket the output into a particular category. For example, someone does a fraud. You want to know if it's a fraud, yes or no. You don't want to have any other thing, right? So that's that's what uh, classification algorithm does. Uh, regression is, is continuous, uh, where you're trying to, for example, load forecasting. You want to forecast the, the energy of a particular thing. You want to forecast what the sales would be. You want to predict how much the sales would be. So that's those are all things uh, which is continuous in nature. It can take value. It can take any real value, while classification is very, very definite. Someone was talking about computer vision. So we have, whether it's a cat or a dog, it's, it's very definite. You want to classify everything as either this or that. So that's when uh, classification comes. 
Uh, so we'll talk about what uh, machine learning is. So it's exactly uh, these are the formal definitions of that. Doing it uh, all it tells is that when you have data, you want to learn what the system does, and that's uh, so it encapsulates what we will be doing today in action. Um, so how many of you have experience using R before? And um, uh, any any machine learning algorithm, prediction, classification, how many of you have done in R? No, it could be in any language. It could be in very few people. So, so let me talk about a very high level process on what. So this is the formalizing. This is formalizing what we talked about before. Then we have a lot of data. The, the, this is the process that we would, we would implicitly be following when, when we use all the algorithms. Okay, so we assume that the data is generated by by some function. We don't know what that function is, right? So, when, when we do, for example, fraud uh, or uh, energy forecasting, whatever it is that we are looking for, we assume that it comes from a particular distribution. Uh, there's an algorithm which which generates the data. Okay, uh, we don't know what the data is. It's coming from somewhere. Okay. The aim of a machine learning algorithm is to find an approximate algorithm so that we are somewhere near the target distribution. All that we have is the, are the observed data. We just have the observed data. We don't have anything else. We don't know what the uh, we don't know what the target distribution is. But all we have is the observed data. We have a lot of algorithms in our skill set. We will talk about some of them. We have logistic regression, we have linear regression, we have support vector machines, we have neural networks. So there are just different kind of uh, algorithms that's that's in place. The, the aim is to fit an algorithm which takes the data and to minimize the error that we, we have. To ensure that we have a model which is uh, which we think is a reasonable approximation of the unknown target distribution and use it in practice. Okay, this is this is all that we are going to do. So we have we don't know this, but we have the data. So we're doing some learning, some this is what we would do, all the algorithms. Of course, there's an infinite number of algorithms that we can select from. And then we would we would select one such model as our final prediction model. Which model to select, how we would do that, are things that, that we would talk talk briefly in, in today's talk. Okay. Um, before we actually go into that, I want to talk about the different kinds of learning paradigms that there are. Because, uh, I mean, these are the more major categorizations of the learning paradigms. Supervised learning, unsupervised, reinforcement learning, online learning. Okay. Supervised learning is, 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 a, is something when we already know what has happened. For example, fraud, right? We already know if a fraud has been committed or not. So if this is the transaction information in, in the past, if they have committed fraud or not. Uh, another example is someone defaulting. For example, you have a credit card. Uh, you keep by getting a lot of, you make, you do a lot of purchases. And at some point of time, you stop paying. The company really wants to know, is it an abnormal behavior, or are you really not going to pay, are you going to foreclose the loan, what's going to happen. So that's something which, or oh, it's, it's all about risk mitigation. They want to know if, if it's a fraud or if it's something is really defaulting, what what can happen. Credit cards are okay, but uh, home loans, uh, this is what triggered, uh, was, was, it, was one of the major reasons in for subprime prices, when people are not paying back their home loans. What happens? Can you predict the default behavior for uh, for various customers? Uh, it, it, it can. It can even be organizations, right? It need not be only for uh, customers. It can even be for organizations. Uh, so supervised learning is something when you have the final labels, when when you already know what the final labels are. You have to start information. You know if someone if something has happened or not, and what, what what's the Final output. That's what the labels are. So you take the training. So 
Christine? Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, you have the training data and you create features out of it. Okay. And again, you feed into an algorithm, you know what the label is, you work on you work on a way to minimize the error and, and you, you come up with, with the final model. The model is here. So you have new data which comes in. So you have historical information, you're trying to predict if someone is uh, defaulting or not. And you have a model in place. Have, and now you have new set of data. And then you, you create the same set of features and you feed into the model and then you have an output and which tells if those people will default or not. So this is a very simplistic representation of how super is learning work. And that predicted output is always one of the labels from the training set? Or do you not I mean, so, so you, so again, so you know, you know what your business problem is, right? So if I want default, yes or no, it's just two options. So, uh, again, cats or dogs or something else, you have three options. So you're, when we talk about classification, it's, it's finite. I mean, comparing this with, with, uh, uh, regression problem, it, it, it's the same thing for regression too. You would, you would have, you would have all the energy information, energy usage in a particular city and you want to forecast what the, Energy requirement for the next uh, three months only. So you you create a model, and the output there would be a real real number. So it, it all depends on what your model is is built to or predict. If it's classification, it's always you all you already know what what class labels that you want, and you're going to work on something which works on that. Unsupervised learning is, is slightly different from supervised. It's very different from supervised learning in the sense that here you don't know what the class labels are. You don't use the class labels. You just have the features. You just observe uh, log information. Um, let's see. Okay, so you want to predict if someone will default on a credit card loan or not. What all can be the features? Demographic information, age, gender. Okay, demographic information, okay. Income, basically. Income, okay. And his other liabilities data. Other liabilities data, okay. Credit score. Credit score, okay. Yeah. Past historic transactional information, what kind of his past payment history, right? So you can you have, so these are all information which would go into one person's feature. And then with this information, you already know if it's uh, defaulted or not. If it's a supervised algorithm. If it's unsupervised algorithm, you you only have all these features. The aim of unsupervised learning is to come up with a better representation. Some of the reasons why it's needed, I mean, some of the reasons are that it might be that there are too many features. Right? You don't want to work with too many features. You want to work with only a subset of features. Um, that's Typical problem is the features, all the data cannot fit into the memory. Then you want to somehow uh, come up with an algorithm which can represent this in a lower dimension. That's one of the reasons why we would use unsupervised learning. And uh, uh, so one of the main, uh, so principal component analysis is one way of doing dimensionality reduction. We'll talk about it later on. That's that's one way of reducing it from say if you have thousand variables but you want to shrink it to only hundred variables, then you would you would come up with an algorithm for doing that. Uh, this is unsupervised learning. Uh, we, we talked about a couple most of reinforcement learning and online learning. Online learning is when you have when you when when reinforcement learning is when the all the data is not available to you right away. So you have all the data and some output. And uh, and then you work with what you have, you predict, the new outputs come, then you modify. So that's one way of reinforcement learning. Um, it, it it uses a lot of game theory to do that. Online learning is when uh, you predict something and immediately you have the output. So you use that and you retrain the model and you again predict something and you have the output. A classic example I mean, <coughs> with, with your uh, browser behavior, you do something. Immediately you click, they know that if you have clicked that, then you have to do something else. So that's uh, that's a place where online learning is widely used. Uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning both are batch. They are not uh, not really real time. So 
just uh, keep that in mind. You have all the data and you try to work with a way to optimize based on the historical data that you have and then come up with uh, your output. Okay. So, <coughs> okay, before we get started on the hands on, we talk a bit about pre processing, we will introduce one or two algorithms, then we will go and implement it, and then we will come back and do more algorithms. So, one of the things that when we have the data, the first thing that we will do is to pre process the data. If we don't pre process the data, it can have a lot of problems. There could be it could be wrong data. It could not. It could have outliers. So these are all things which would mess up the machine learning algorithm. So we would, we would need to do a lot of pre-processing, at least a bit of pre-processing. One of the first thing that we would do is to do something called a data cleansing operation. You look into all the features, and for all the features, you want to see if if there are outliers in the data or not. If there are outliers, how do you want to handle it? Are they actual? Do they make business sense? Or, for example, we have age as one of the features, right? Someone has an age of age sixty-five. Does it? Uh, is it true? Yes. Does it make any logical sense, business sense? So you have to evaluate. All the all the information. So, as I told, just uh, always see the big picture in mind. Look at what what's happening, what's around, and then and then get started. The next thing is missing data. This is something which we will see a lot in 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 practice. You have data and you have a very important feature, but but data is missing for many records. So what kind of activities would you do to replace missing data? What do you think you can do when you have a single data? You can just find out the mean and Okay, so then we can, can substitute it with an average of what's available. Okay. That's, that's a very common practice to do. To, uh, we call it uh, data imputation. So impute the missing values with the mean of the uh, column. Uh, any other? So for other features, uh, other features for which data is available, uh, find similar records mm -hmm. and, and, and then do the mean of them. Okay. Yeah, we could use other we could use other columns. Uh, so, so the way I would I would say is you can use other features and build actually a model for this particular column, right? So you're, uh, you can you can first you can build a model for the missing missing records. And then you can do it. But you can see the problem. It can, uh, well, mean is a very simplistic approach. It's, it's very easy to do. Uh, building a specific model for, for all the missing values can get really complicated. So that uh, that really defeats purpose. But but then if you think that that column is the feature is very important, then, then you go ahead and do it. Um, outliers. What do you do for outliers? If it is a multi varied data, so you build a cluster and look at outliers and remove this. No, no. So, how do you look for outliers? The way to look for outliers, first thing always you have to do is when you have the data plotted. Okay. So, that's, yeah. 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 that's the first thing you have to do. Just see how, how it is, what the distribution is. And then you would, you would know if the data has outliers or not. If that particular feature has outliers, uh, one of the most common things which uh, practitioners do is to cap the data. So you you cap it at the 95th or 99th percentile and you cap it at the first or fifth percentile. You cap at both the levels. For example, income. Someone has an income of minus two hundred thousand dollars. That's definitely an outlier. That's not a missing data, but that's, we know that that's an erroneous data. How do you how do you handle that? So you you Cap, you cap it at zero, or you find the distribution and find the fifth percentile of the distribution and then cap it there. That's something that's done. Okay, this is something which we do. I mean, for most of the algorithms, this is mandatory to do. Uh, if you don't do it explicitly, the algorithm doesn't implicitly. Uh, we have to standardize or normalize the data. Uh, 
when, when you normalize, all it means is it has uh, mean one and variance. It has uh, zero variance. So that's that's the thing that sorry, zero. <laughs> mean invariant variance. Sorry. Yeah. So that's that's the thing that that you that you work for when when you standardize data. Uh, when you normalize data, standardization is similar to normalization, just that you don't you don't really uh, normalize it to unit variance, but for example, you can. Uh, so the reason that we do is to ensure that all the columns are equal and similar. Right? Income, income will be in hundred thousands of dollars, okay, and age is in age will be less than hundred. It will be a number between zero and hundred. So when you have when you build a model, it can easily happen that you, your uh, one particular column can can really dominate the others just because it has a large uh, numeric value. So to, to account for that, what you do is you ensure that everything is, is within the same uh, range. And, and so this is this is extremely essential. If you don't have it, the, the output gets messed up. The, and we, we could still, the algorithms would still run, but the results are not, not the same. Okay, this 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 is another thing for better representation. Uh, when we have a lot of data which doesn't fit into the memory, in those cases we would we would need to do a principle of often dimensional regression. Okay, next thing that we would do is to see future creation transformation. We will talk a bit about this. Okay, principle of analysis. It's it's a dimensional it's an unsupervised learning algorithm. So we take we take a lot of features and then it gets uh, it's very, okay. You you try to get it to a lower dimension. So you have like say hundred thousand columns. So hundred thousand columns with with a million records will not fit into your laptop model. Then what you do is you you try to come up with with an algorithm which can reduce it to hundred or two hundred variables. The top variables, and then you take it and and use it for your models. That's that's one of the things that, that it does. Uh, so it's it sometimes happens that uh, with data reduction, how can you ensure that the predictive accuracy of prediction is not compromised? Okay, so we'll talk about how to. So we'll, that's about how so. Which model you select, right? So your question ultimately boils down to which model you select. I, I build one model with the actual features. I build another model with principal components. Of these two, which model should I select? Right? Uh, we'll talk about it. It's it's the same thing. It's the same thing. If you use a logistic regression or if you use a subnet vector machine, so two computing algorithms. Which one should I use? So, uh, there is no direct. Uh, so there is no loss of information actually because. We can actually translate any point in, so there are two different dimensional systems, right? Or uh, different coordinate systems. It's, it's, so we can okay. directly translate. So. so people argue about this, but I mean, so when you do principal component, there is a loss of information. You, you are not using all your features, right? The, the only way to do is if your features <laughs> can represent the maximum variance of uh, what's available in your data. If you have it, then then you can go ahead and, and use those features. So you are taking care of most of the variation in the data anyway. So, like this, way. not all the variation. You take most of the variation. So that's the right word. So you you can never tell. So that's that's the reason why we would use something called uh, model. Uh, when you have model evaluation techniques, we will talk about how we would do when when you have. Uh, I mean, so do people follow what's happening? The, the question is, so instead of using all these features, we are telling that we are going to shrink the variables and then use it. Which means that we are not using all the features. So the question is, will it compromise my output quality? Will it compromise my prediction? I have a good question. Like data compression, we reduce or we remove a lot of uh, <coughs> features. Like it's not exactly it's easy, but we remove a lot of information and we can still understand it. So it's mostly used. This thing is used for visualization of data rather than actually doing the predictions. Because you lose the data, you lose the predictions. <coughs> No, you would no, no, you would use. So that's that's a very good example. You you compress the data. For example, in in when you when you do a lot of computer vision and things like that, um, until the deep learning came into place, principal confidence was like 
one of the first steps which people used to do because you have lot of data and which cannot fit into the memory. When you have lot of features which cannot fit into the memory, you always try to come up with a subset of features so that you can you can put it. Ultimately, you need a model. Okay, right. So if your data cannot fit into your memory, what can you do? You have to find an algorithm which can do that. And that's one of the reasons. That's a place where this will definitely help. And, and again, we'll talk about model validation techniques where it, it doesn't matter what your features are. It, it matters on uh, how it performs on actual real data. The principal components or actual features, if it works well on your actual data, then, then it means that that model really is a close representation of your unknown target, which, which you really don't know. So that's something that we have to do. Feature creation transformation. Sometimes what happens is the, the features stand alone as such may not be very significant. It may not uh, tell what impact it has on your on your final variables. So when you have those scenarios, you, you might want to transform. For example, a log, you can square it, you can get a cube. Uh, common thing which people do is you multiply the features. See if two features by themselves may not be, be able to explain why something is happening. But when you multiply the two features, it can it can happen. You don't have any really example for it. You think about it, but but you could think about it, right? So two two things, two extremely uh, different things can. Uh, so I mean, so I can be some like I can do something like this. My wife can do something like that. But once the model realizes that we are married, it can it can predict how uh, in the, the performance, how our purchase behavior will be. So some so in face recognition, there's a good example for this. In sense, sure. it's not a prediction, but uh, the some of the features they use is distance between eyes, distance between an eye and uh, the nose, something like that. But the distances themselves don't actually can act, can't actually be used for comparing because of the you know scaling and things like that. So they find the ratios of them. Mm -hmm. So the ratio of distance between eyes to distance between an eye and a hawk. That's it's a good example. That's a good example. People get it. So when you have so yeah, facial recognition instead of using actual features, you can take the ratio of the distances and then use that as features, and that. Has come out to be significant. So, uh, how does transforming a feature from say linear feature logarithm? How does it help? So, if I have a salary as a feature, right? You said I mean, so it's, uh, I mean, I'm not telling that salary is a feature to take log, right? So, the way you do it is you plot and you find you find correlation between two variables. If they are correlated with uh, with the feature axis, then that's the variable you use. Or if it's correlated with the logarithm of it, then you use as by taking an algorithm. Uh, so you, you wouldn't know. There's no hard and fast rule telling that you know. But even before you start, you have to take log them. You have to square the variables. You, you wouldn't know that. One thing, of course, when you plot it, you get a sense of how it is. If you know if the plot is going exponential or the plot is all over the place, you would know that what kind of transformation would help. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was just saying some systems are inherently exponential and longer than it. For instance, response or a response for years to some, it is logarithmic. So, if you are predicting something in terms of you know effect of some, then you may want to take log. So, yeah, I'll, I'll give you another example. Okay. So, I mean, also all of you use credit cards, right? So when you get a new credit card, the chances of you cancelling the credit card is very high the month or two after you get it. So somebody would have just got your signature and you would have got it. You know that they have, they have, and then you come to know that it has yearly charge. You don't want to spend. You call and cancel. It happens always in the first two three months. But if someone has been using it for a long time, then you know that the chances of the person canceling the credit card is very low because he has been with you for so many years that he is not going to cancel. So it's always a curve like this that you you would know and. Uh, other example is uh, is uh, probability of dying when you are an infant. The probability is very high, and then it drops in teenage, middle age it drops, and as you become older, the probability of dying again increases. 
So these are common uh, way of distributions which uh, companies, for example, healthcare companies use this kind of distribution to model anything which they do. So those, those, those are examples where uh, you, you know from your business that that's the kind of uh, system that you're looking for and, and so transformation, you can think about transforming to fit that kind of distribution. So one more point to <coughs> the transformation is one thing is we only need know how to do linear algebra. So whenever we have non-linear relations, since we don't know how to work with them, we use a transformation to linear right? So for instance, if you want to find a relation between two variables, which is a quadratic relation, say between <coughs> y and x squared, you turn that into a linear relation, I mean say between y and x, then you turn it into a linear relation between y and x squared. Because you don't know how to do anything except linear algebra. That's so and that's cynical, trivial, but that's what it comes that's down to. Trivial is a yeah, but, <laughs> but that's that's what it is. No, but see, okay, so I agree to that. But the thing is, the reason why we are doing it is linear regressions. There are far more algorithms for doing linear regression, and it's more tractable. Uh, we know that. I mean, we are not covering any mathematical things here, but uh, mathematically doing something in a linear space is always easier. It's tractable. It's it's, it can be solvable in finite time uh, rather than doing something non-linear. When you, when you do non-linear, okay, so when, um, I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a couple of slides. But it's a very common, like in spoke vector machines, we transform a, uh, you know, multi, uh, you know, multi-dimensional features into Gaussian space by using colors to get a hyperplane, right? So, that kind of uh, transformation help. We will be lost, but <laughs> so it will not be Gaussian space. Okay, we will we'll, we'll not get into that. But 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 the concept is the the the, the linear part is with the coefficients. It's not with with how with your features. Your features, it's, it's it can be anything. It can be a combination of features. It can be it, it it's about how you generate it, right? And once you have it, you know that your feature is generated. You have a test set which is going to come. You can do the exact transformation before you feed into the algorithm. When, when so, on the algorithm fits a linear coefficient for each of the things. It, it fits a real value for each of the feature vectors. That's what uh, that's what linear uh, regression does. When you do something called non-linear stuff, all you're trying to do is you all you're trying you're trying to tell that my feature should have a power of something. Okay, that's a lot harder and we need to use a lot of calculus to do that. And uh, I mean, I don't know how many of you remember calculus, but the thing is, if something has to be solved, then you need to know if it's a minimum or maximum and the conditions, uh, first derivative has to be equal to zero and you can be stuck at local minima. So things um, we have learned a long time. Back. So that's one of the reasons why we don't get into nonlinear that easily, because there are good, very good linear approximations. Yeah, so that, that's what I told. So when you do that, then there's a concept of local minima, you'll be stuck. I have a plot much later. Remind me when you come to this plot, I'll explain what happens. Someone have one. Okay. So okay, this should actually come before that. But you want to ensure that you visualize and summarize your data before you start modeling so that you know exactly where uh, things are. Okay, so that uh, you come up with an experience. You, you, so that you have an intuitive understanding of how, what your features are, and how, what the distribution is, <laughs> what kind of things make sense. Again, it ties back to my uh, first slide. Don't lose the picture. Have that in mind when, when you start the modeling process. The first thing that, the first algorithm that we would look at is linear regression. Before that, any questions? Yes, Hasgeek is the username. Uh, uh, we are working on it. Just, yeah. you know, give us some time. That's what we are trying to see. Just give us some time. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, do all of you have R installed on your system, R Studio? Anyone who doesn't have one, two, three. Okay. 
you have, right? You can, you can work and see what they're doing. I think one, two people without art sitting next to each other. Yeah, maybe you can move to you You can find someone who has Okay. So, just going back on slide, uh, when you said normalize what the data, what to eat? <laughs> normalize the data, does uh, it mean actually back to the data to a normal distribution? No, 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 no. When you, when, you, when you tell that it's normal, normalize the data, the way you do it is, uh, you do this, right? X minus mu over sigma. So you, do, you subtract it with the mean of the column and you divide it by the standard deviation. So that's that's called the normalizing stuff. So that's that's uh, that's the way you normalize. So you take each value and subtract it. For each, in a feature vector, you take each value, subtract it with the mean of that column and divide it by the standard deviation of that column. When you do that, you, you're standardizing it. You're normalizing it. When you're standardizing it, there are, there are other techniques. So instead of using standard deviation, you divide it by the maximum minus minimum, the range. So you, you do, uh, you take the value, you subtract it with the mean, and you divide it by the range of your call. That's called standardizing. So you can do either standardize or you can normalize. Uh, the preference would be to normalize, but there are cases when standardizing data also gives equally good results. Particularly when your when your variance is all over the place, it makes sense to use range. You need to install both. First, install R, and which site? Which site? I installed it last night. It works. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Which one? R Studio does it? Are you able to install R Studio? Yeah, it's one. If you have R, good enough. Everything will work in R. Use R. It works if you don't use HTTPS. Okay, just use HTTPS. I installed after coming to work. Okay. So first install R, then R Studio. Okay. Don't install R Studio before installing R. We didn't talk about kernels. Uh, kernels is another way to um, he covered that a bit. So you want to transform your data into a higher dimensional space instead of computing the entire high, higher dimensional space. You just use a kernel to do that. Um, it's highly, it's predominantly used for support vector machines, but you can use it for for transformations. So, uh, we will we'll look into it during the hands-on. Now, any other questions? Okay, so this is linear regression. Okay, so you have you have a lot of data points all over the place, and you try to fit a line. That's what. It is. So this is something which we would have done in school, engineering, college. You do y equal to m x plus c. This is what. This is how the equations would look. So you have. Yeah, these are all your features, and you try to. This is what you are going to estimate. The betas are what you're going to estimate. They are your features. That's what the algorithm does. It tries to find what the betas are for each of your xx. Ultimately, you will come up. You will get an equation like this. Once you have an equation like this, when the new data comes, uh, you you can substitute these values. So this the algorithm would tell. When the new data comes, you know what these features are. You you enter it, and you know what your Output values. It's the most simplest of algorithms. Uh, I'm sure many of you would have even tried it in Excel. You can just plot some points and then right click fit a trend line. You will you will get a. That what it does is basically a linear regression model. Um, that's the most simplest of stuff. The way the way it does is something called a least square approach. You can going to minimize the least square. For each of the value, for each of the data, your training data, you know what your uh, uh, output is, right? You know what your output is. You're going to predict something. So basically, it starts with some random assignments to this, and it, it finds some prediction. It squares the prediction, so because there can be negative, positive, you're squaring it so that it's all in the same sign. And you're trying to minimize this error. 
This is called least minimizing least squares. Okay. This is this is the objective function for for linear regression. You spotted this. So uh, for classification, what can be a problem for this? Can we do something like this? You want to predict someone is defaulted or we not? We have to define some arbitrary thresholds to do that. Cannot calculate a least square. No, no, no. His answer is right. So, no, you can you can calculate. The thing is, you have you have all these values, right? I mean, you, you know what the features are. You and your y value basically is default. You will set if someone is defaulted, it's one. Someone hasn't defaulted, you set it as zero. That's how you code it. So you have a value, you set it up, and then you set a model. But but you can see where it goes, right? It's not bounded by zero and one. Linear regression doesn't give you a natural bound on what it is. They, depending on on what your features are, your value can go from minus infinity to plus infinity. And in that case, you have to set up a threshold which defines where, if it crosses a threshold, then it's default. If it doesn't, then it's it's not defaulting. That's what it is. And now we understand why we want to standardize or normalize the data. So my feature vector is something like salary. In your data, your salary maximum that you see is only uh, twenty thousand dollars. Suddenly, someone comes with a two million dollar, and your y value goes over the roof, so which means that your your prediction is not very robust. And that's one of the reasons why we try to standardize the data to ensure that your output is not is is constrained within a particular value. Again, the thing is. The problem with linear regression is you have to define your own thresholds. There's no automatic way of the model itself constraining the values to give predictions. Uh, it's, but then it's it's one of the simplest algorithms. It's it's very fast. It's it's good, and it's been around for a long, long, long time. And almost invariably, this is the first algorithm we all start doing with. Um, uh, it's just a moment. Uh, the Wi-Fi has been temporarily set up. Uh, I request only if it is absolutely necessary, uh, you know, go for it. We have a temporary one running now. We are trying to figure out the main issue. So, if it is absolutely necessary, go on because there is a slight bandwidth problem. So, if it is necessary, you can uh, use the same Hasgeek Wi-Fi and Hasgeek Wi-Fi with the same password which we mentioned previously. Geeks are. Thank you. Okay, so logistic regression uses a logistic function. Uh, the logistic function is basically e to the x over one plus e to the x. Okay, so just this one over one plus one to the e minus x. This is basically if you divide by e power minus x, you will you get e to the x by one plus e to the x. That's called the logistic function. This function is always bounded between zero and one. The logistic function, the logistic function is bounded between zero and one. So it's, it's so it, it's very natural to use this for uh, for classification algorithms. When you have you want to classify between zero and one, you know that your probabilities are going to be between zero and one. Then it's easier to define a threshold. So it, I mean, it's easy. Point five, you can set a threshold, and anything above point five is. Defaulting if it's less than point five, then you're not defaulting. So this is your linear model, right? You, this is what we did in the last lecture. So you take the same thing and you fit the same thing in, in the logistic function, and you use the same, uh, uh, and then you you again fit this, and you try to come up with the parameters for this. You estimate all the betas. You get your logistic regression. This is some of the most widely used uh, classification algorithms. For example, uh, for credit scores, so um, possible score or in, or in US when you want to get your credit score. Until a few years back, almost everyone used the logistic regression. It was like the de facto algorithm for logistic regression. Two algorithms. Uh, what we will do now, I, I have, we have more things to cover, but we, let's do a little bit of hands-on. We'll, we'll ensure that 
uh, we'll do some data summarization, we'll fit a logistic regression model, and then come back and continue with what we have done. Okay. That makes sense. Yes. Uh, which is a new algorithm you just mentioned uh, a couple of years back. We will come to that. We will talk about that. So, so now people use, I mean, we will we'll soon do run the same algorithm. Random forest or regularized logistic regression, they use so two things which predominantly use. Okay, so this is our studio. People haven't seen uh, people come from all this is an ID for R. It's like it's like when you have Java, you use Eclipse for creating code. I don't know if people still use Eclipse. Previously they used to use. But something like that. Uh, this is an ID basically for R. Um, it's very good. It's the most widely used. It's the most widely used ID for R. You have so you have a console where you can type the commands and the output comes immediately and you have the environment tells what all variables are stored here, all the historical commands will be stored here. So all of you have all of you opened so the first thing you would do is to check version. What kind of version do you have? You have some I mean, you should have at least version 3 and about from the latest one you have. I don't have the latest one, so you have to have latest versions. Uh, next thing would be to see what your current working directory is. Okay, I have set myself to, so you might want to create a directory to get it. If you don't know, so the way to set working directory is this, set working directory. And then give the path of your wherever you want to set it. Can't see the font. Over this, okay. So the next thing would be to do a safe working directory. You have to can you can do this through the directory that you want. Okay. So now I have the data stored. The way you do it is this is the command. You're going to, this is the assignment operator in R. Okay, so also use equal to, but this is the, stand, the standard way of doing it. You are going to read the CSV. Can we add the CSV in the sentence? I don't have it. So we're going to read the CSV. I mean, we read the CSV, but we want to know how much time it takes to read the CSV, right? So maybe it tells how much time this task takes. It's on the funnel. I have one Dropbox location to download it. 
So how many of you don't have the data? Okay. Few people. Uh, we'll have a break sometime soon. So we can just follow and then on the break you can get a pen drive and, and uh, copy it. Okay. <laughs> The next step is to see how much time it takes to load the data. When you have the data, you go into environment lab. The data is there. It's got a bunch of columns, columns features. The uh, aim of today's session is to predict default. So when someone is defaulted, it's be the default of a credit card. We have a list of features and. Uh, Default 1 is 0, 1 is default, 0 is not default. Um, instead of clicking those, the other way to do it is you can do a head of input data or it prints the first few records with all the columns. Uh, it, it's okay when you have less columns, when you have a lot of columns, it, it's not advisable. Uh, first thing that we want to see is what are the column names. Okay. So when you do names of input data, it gives the list of names. Uh, default is what we want to predict. That's the target that we work with. We have a list of columns. Uh, number of unsecured lines, age, monthly income, debt ratio, number of dependents, uh, the category of the state is, and these are the things. Okay. Now, it's not always true that the data that is loaded is in the format is in, is, is in the same uh, format as that we need. Okay, so let's see. So these are all numeric, right? They'll all be numeric. And we have the so this is this is a categorical variable. So we have one categorical variable and all the eleven variables are so when you have data it's generally a mix of uh, real variables, integers and Categorical variables. <laughs> Again, categorical variables can be of two types. There could be, for example, if this is grade, we know that grade A is better than grade B, is better than grade C, than grade D. Okay. Or it could be that these four are totally separate. Uh, there's no, there's no comparison between these two. Call it between ordinal variables and nominal variables to to way of defining it. Okay. Clear the controls. So now we have the data. But the first thing that we are going to do is to see what the column types. Okay, so how much has this announcement to do? Yeah, so hi everyone, uh, I will be the presenting the solar shop today. So here are some pen drives. Uh, it has the uh, image file which we will be using, and plus instruction on how to import the images. So just uh, pass this pen drive around and just copy the content of this pen drive. Okay. So now we saw the names of all the all the uh, columns. We want to see the types which an importer makes sense. Okay, so the way to see the types is you do something called a couple of ways to do it. Okay. Use something called L apply. Apply is a family of functions. Okay, it takes an argument of it takes an argument of what the data set is. Occasionally, it, it asks if the function has to be applied row-wise or column-wise, and, and, and the function that we need to implement. 
So here we have uh, default as integer. So new make is basically real. Okay, so integer real, and then we have factor. Factor is the same as category. Okay. So you want to know if you want to know what are the different. Uh, so how many of you know SQL here? Is there anyone who doesn't know SQL here? <laughs> okay. So the way okay, no one, everyone knows SQL. Okay, good. So I want to know what are the uh, unique values present in uh, state category. Okay. The way you do it is select just in state category from uh, input data. The way you do it in R is you do this unique. Okay. So the way this is how you you there are two the problem with uh, or the good thing whichever way you think about it is there are multiple ways to do the same thing. Okay. Uh, when you learn R, you can it can be so frustrating because there is too there are too many ways to do the same thing. For example, to access that particular state category, there are like almost a dozen ways to do it. Okay. So this is one way. So you, you give, you know what the input, you know what the data set that you want us, and you know what the uh, column name is. The way to select the column name is with dollar, and you tell unique. Uh, some of you might have worked with matrices before, MATLAB before. Uh, the way to do it in that style is it's a twelve column, so it's the same thing. So it's my matrix with the 12th column. Okay. It's exactly the same thing. So unique is, is a command to do that. Okay. Now okay. we will get to the background. Can anyone tell what ZC will does? Yeah it randomizes. It makes the series of steps randomizable. Yeah, it, 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 it does randomize, it randomizes which can be reproducible. So that's what it does. Okay. Uh, I don't know other languages, I don't know if Java has something similar. But, uh, what is it randomizing? Is it randomizing? Only language has seed, okay. Uh, <laughs> so it affects our subsequent calls to that. Uh, random number. It's yes, and it ensures that this. So, so when I when I do a RAND uh, of five, it always gives me the same RAND of it. I will come to that. Okay. The, the reason that we are going to do it is we are going to create something called the train list. Okay. I am going to take 80% of my data and create that as my training set. We will create our models on 80% of data and then we will predict on the remaining 20% and see how our accuracy is. We will do all sort of model evaluation on that. Okay. So sample, sample is, is a function which creates sample values. I am telling it to generate sample between 1 and 150,000. I want how many numbers should be generated? We should generate eighty percent of the rows of input data. So before that we do how much is it? Hundred and fifty thousand. Okay. So n row of input data is hundred and twenty thousand. So we need hundred and twenty thousand numbers. Okay. So it generates hundred and twenty. So you can look into end of the list. Will may tell me what it is. The way to remove it is RM. I removed it. And uh, you people don't remove it so that we know what it is. I don't remember what was there. We will see. This is it the same number? It will, it will be the same number that is generated. Uh, 120,000 will be the same as what it generated before. Can you please explain once more what we are training in? What's the objective? Okay. We have actually okay. okay. I don't know if you can see this. Okay, let me increase it. 
we, are, we want to predict if a particular user is defaulting or not. Okay, this is credit. This is a credit card information. Okay, you have credit card data. Uh, how much? What is the revolving rate? How many? How much percentage of his credit has he used? What's his age? Uh, I think that's number of times delinquent uh, between 30 and 60 days. What's the rate ratio? What's his monthly income? Number of dependents? What state? The category of the state that he is. Uh, it's got various values. Uh, you can see some values are missing. Looks like a real data. That's so we are trying to predict if someone will default. If, if this is the information, we we I mean the what generally happens is you're getting you're given this information, we'll create a model, and then when new data comes, you want to predict if someone will default or not. Okay. So what we are trying to do is we are taking 80% of the data, we we are building a model. We'll do some machine learning models on that. <coughs> Basically, we'll do a logistic regression on that, and then we'll predict it on the 20. We'll predict using the 20% data and see how accurate our model has been. That's what we need to do. And, and the frameless right now is just a vector of just 120,000. Which one? The training list right now. The training list is 120,000 records. Yes. Is it record or just? Yeah, 120,000 records of 11, 12 columns. Yes. So these are your features. These have 120,000 records. Okay. So same thing that's what we see the same thing, right? Same thing that I have. Okay. okay. So, okay. The way to remove something from the from the history from the environment is the RM, and then we give the object name. So, train. I'm going to create a train data set. It's. I'm going to take. So, this is this is a list of rows which I want. So, it's row comma column, right? The list of rows I want is. What's there in train list? So it gives my train. Okay. So what will be my test? Test is basically input data minus train list. Okay. Whatever is not there in train list, I need it. So it creates test. So you can see that train is created with 120,000 records and test is created with 30,000 records. Okay. I'm finding that if I run n row on train list, I don't get a do. I get null. Okay. Because do this class of train list. It's an integer. Okay. Your rows and columns will work only on matrices. Okay, so data frame and matrix two important things in in uh, R. Uh, data frame is I mean both are like tables for your SQL. Matrix is homogeneous. All the data types are the same. Okay. So everything is numeric, integer, it's homogeneous. Data frame is like a SQL table. It can have characters, it can have text, uh, one column can be date, one column. So that's that's basically the difference. Matrix is all numeric. What was the idea behind the set sheet? Thank you. Reproducible random numbers. Just specifically here, what are Samples. Okay. I'm creating a sample of something between uh, 1 and 150,000. I need 120,000. I need to generate 120,000 numbers between okay. uh, between that. I can I can I can switch. I can clear this. I can run it again. If I delete my train list, if I run it again, it will still create the same same list. We need that to ensure that the same. Record. So these numbers are not coming from the CSV file, nothing to do with that? Nothing to do with the CSV file, not really. Well, this is all R, doing, doing it in R. So now the train list contains, um, yeah, 
dimension of my training data set. It's 120,000 rows by 12 columns. Same thing, we can do one in. This, this will give me what my row count is. This will give me row call. Yeah, will come to summary. Uh, the class of training is basically data frame. Data frame what I told. Okay. You can even find what class of training of 12 means. This factor. Summary. Let's do summary of train. Okay. So for all the columns, it's trying to find its filling. What the minimum is, what the first quarter is, mean, median, mean, median, maximum. Okay. Uh, interestingly, it tells that you know for age, okay. it doesn't tell here. Okay. Number of dependents is there is some null, there is null in monthly income. So a couple of variables has have null values. Monthly income and number of dependents have null values. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll just run this code and I'll show you what it was. Okay. So what I did was I did a loop. This is how you run a loop for open bracket. This is very similar to what it was in other languages for i in 1 to 12. I am going to print the column names. I am going to print what the class is and the summary of it. So the previous way it was all coming together. Now we are just it's default is integer. This is the value. Instead of showing it column, I am doing it by row. Any questions on this? I mean, it's the same as doing this. We did this earlier. It's the same. So, what did you do with that loop thing? That loop thing that you I mean, I'm, I'm just I'm just running the loop which tells for you. See, when you do L apply, it's going to give me like this, right? It's I'm adding all the things, column, class name, summary. So, it comes in a neatly format. So in train we have all the rows corresponding to the numbers in the train list. Yes, you have. So you can open the train here, and you can see the row name, row number is given here, and it has all the data, corresponding data. You can go and check with the input data if the four two four five nine data has the same information. Are these commands also in the? Can you? Forward this command. After we do it, I'll forward. After the session, I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. So now let's try to do. Okay. Now when I try to do maximum, it's telling null. Null. Uh, you can do it for age. 190. Okay. But we know that it's not coming. It's because it has null value. So what you do? Remove can tell all the maximums. Okay. So these are this is summarizing information for a while. Uh, okay. If you want to change the name, okay. This is the name, and you want to change it to something else. You use this. To change in train, you have to change it test also. To ensure that the models can run. Okay. Of course, you can create tables and see how the table is. So, 120,000. There's almost all four of the categories are uh, uh, 30,000. Uh, guys, sir, why should we upload the online So, I'm doing a 
So you can do plots. This is something that you have to do. Uh, you're doing a bar plot. So you have the data, you're doing a bar plot. So the, the way to do this bar plot of what you want to do. Counts basically has a table. So you create a table of what factor that you want to do. Okay. Uh, other thing that you can do is you can do a histogram. So what is the of the age. This is the histogram of the age. The histogram of the age. Okay. It's very easy. Just to stop the column. Okay. You can just do a plot. This will give you a scatter plot. So now we know that there are outliers. Okay. So people are asking how to identify outliers. There are definitely outliers. Everything is here and we have some outliers. So we can ensure that we handle for outliers. We can even subset the data to do. I'm going to plot only if my particular value is less than 50,000. Okay. So we know that it had outliers, so I'm going to do it for year 50,000. Now it looks more uniform. Okay. That's the way you do it. Okay, we would uh, we'll take a break now. See, if you, if you look into the previous plot. If you look into this plot, it's running. But if you look at the plot before, you know that there were outliers, right? So I'm, 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 I'm cutting it off at 50,000 and then I'm going to see how it is. What's the significance of that? Six. Six. Six a column. Column six. So basically, I'm telling it's always row column, okay? I want all my rows which are less than 50,000 and the six column of the. So the okay. row can be a number or it can be an expression? Yeah, row can be a number or an expression. Row, I mean, it has to evaluate to a, a number. It can it should evaluate to a list of numbers, right? It evaluates to a list of numbers. Okay, good point. So what, what happens when I do train of... Any guess? It'll, it, it's a logical record. It will give me true or false. Okay, it will give me it's true, true, true. Okay, so now, now it will take that record. It will find if it's true or false. If it's true, it gets, it gets printed. Otherwise, it doesn't get. Printed. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take a break now. When we come back, we will we'll do some more stuff. Now. Yeah, so it automatically does. So if you look into, so okay, the way to do it help is something like this. Okay, you can do like this. When I do question mark, it gives what it help us. You can look into what, uh, you can look into the syntax of it. You can set your own frequency. Okay, this is the record number. Yes, this is a record. Column number. Okay. So hold on. No, no. We'll, 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 we'll take a break now. Okay. So we'll we'll meet after the break. Okay. Any questions? I'll I'll go over all these concepts quickly. Okay. So now we talk about creating models. Okay. There is something very important that people should know that's called bias variance trade-off. So this is this is the data that I have. Okay. Uh, I this is how I generate it. It's a sine curve. I use the sine curve data and I distort it some of the values. Okay. So we know that the source is a sine curve. But let's see what happens when we try to fit it using some complicated algorithm. Okay, I can actually write an algorithm which connects something like this. Okay, this is called a spline. So I can fit a polynomial regression which can connect me to all the points. But but you can see the problem here, right? So let's see what happens when we extend it. The way it goes, it goes here. But we know that the model goes up, but the model is going down here. So this is a problem. 
called low bias high variance it it, it it fits in the entire data but it wouldn't work very well when you have new data in place a simplistic model would be something like this but then here the thing is there will be more training error and uh, there will be more training error we call that higher bias but it's going to have lower variance in your when your actual test data comes in which one should we select and it's not always so it depends on your big picture in mind it depends on what your application demands it's always better to use a simpler model okay we call this a concept called occam's razor to do with something so it's all reading yeah it is called over, that's my next slide okay so, <laughs> so yes okay but i'm just telling that this is a place where i'm, I'm just telling two competing models where when you have absolutely low bias you wouldn't know if it really fits everything or not i'm telling here i fitted everything but you get the concept that you can have a low bias high bias but always it's better to go for something which is simpler than something more complex Give some practical. Small, small practical. This is one practical example. This is how my data is. Okay, I'm going to predict. You can take any sign uh, sign curve application. This is how my data is going to look like. But when I create a machine learning algorithm, I have two options to do it. Which one should I select? You should always keep that in mind. My bias. What? No, this is this is this is machine learning concept. Okay, in machine learning, there is uh, this is how bias is used. Bias is when you don't have any input, how much are you offset with? Okay, when you when you did a linear regression, this is your bias term. This is your bias. Irrespective of my input, I'm still I'm biased. But you can optimize it to an extent where uh, bias is low, bias is high. So the aim is to ensure that you get to a level where uh, your model works very well. Uh, so the way that I show here is non-linear, but again I can transform it into a higher dimensional and I can do a linear separation. So uh, it's not necessary that. It, okay. This model, if it is a non-linear model, okay, I agree. But but, uh, but then you can also do a linear uh, linear model with that, okay. So what is the low bias and the high bias, and this offset from the origin? That's it. The difference from the origin causes offset from the high. So the way I understand from this curve, high bias means or bias means error in your model with respect to the training data. Itself. That is right. That's what it is. That's your your error with respect to your your training data. Will define what your bias is, and your variance is on your <coughs> unseen data, which you don't know. So how do you find out? Uh, we will talk about it. There is something called cross validation, validation, cross validation, uh, to give an estimate of how your variance is going to be. The aim is see bias and variance are inversely related. Okay, the aim is to get to a trade off. Where your model works reasonably well on unseen data. That's what the big picture stuff. How do we do that? Is what we're going to do. Look at. It. Uh, so the bias is. Are we setting the bias, or is automatically coming depending on how we? Bias is model. Bias is from the model. Okay. Variance is unseen. We don't know how the variance is going to be. See, this is my data. This is. These are two competing models. I am telling you that I generated the data from sign curve, so the data should go up. But we don't know in reality, right? When we have to predict default or something, we don't know how the output is going to be. So we we wouldn't know the direction of it. So it's always better to go for a simpler model than a complicated model, and that's the reason why it's so. That's the reason why we call this bias variance table. You want to go with low bias, high variance, or low high bias, low variance? It should be somewhere in between. When, when so this is, I mean, what, what can be what can be the best uh, high bias low variance stuff? Variance means the output doesn't vary with when your input comes. Okay, the best high bias low variance stuff is a straight line. I fit a line like this. 
Okay, irrespective of my input, uh, my values are same. So that's high bias, low variance. My, there is no variance in my output, but it's not trained, right? So, but this is relatively better. This is better than this. So that's that's the thing. So when do we stop? It's something that I'm going to talk about now. Okay, overfitting, like what he told last. This model is entirely overfit. You fit on every training data. Now, if you look into the diagram I showed first, the machine learning thought process, there is some some unknown algorithm which which gives us the data. The problem with that is the algorithm also has an inherent noise. We can never model the noise. Overfitting, what it does, it exactly models the noise. So we don't know what the inherent behavior is, and uh, it generally happens when you fit a very 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 complex model. Uh, it's generally not. You wouldn't know. When you build the model, you will know when you are actually deploying it in production, and it can cause a lot of problems. Uh, how to avoid overfitting? There are two predominantly two common concepts: regularization, cross-validation. You use both of them. You don't use any one of them. The way it's generally used in practice is to use both of them. Each one of them is help to minimize, is to balance your bias-variance trade-off. In practice, we use both of them. Uh, regularization, okay, think about it, in, in your, uh, this is the only mathematical equation in the entire deck, <laughs> so bear with me. So, in, in log linear logistic regression, what we saw is we are trying to minimize this, your least square, a top of least square, right? You have your input, you have, you know what the actual output is, you are predicting something, you are trying to minimize it. In, in addition to that, I am imposing some constraints on, on the, what can be the weights? I can add a square term to my weights or I can do a linear term on my weights. These are two options that can happen. Okay. So when you when you add only a square term, it's something it's called ridge regression or least L large. Okay. If if this is zero and only if you use this, it's called uh, lasso. These are two common types of uh, regularized regression, both linear and logistic. It's the same thing. Okay. Uh, the one good thing of this is, is here, because if you don't use this, if you just use this, it tries to use all the variables and it tries to shrink it. It tries to have, it tries to impose penalty on on the coefficient. So the size of the coefficient is uh, constrained by it. Here, the coefficient can become zero. So it does feature selection also. That's one. That's one advantage of this. This one is easier to do. This one is slightly harder. Uh, some the thing which people have been doing last few years been to use both of them. It should sum up to one, and it's called elastic mean regularization. Uh, these are the three common regularization stuff. Okay, before we talk about cross validation, we should know this. Okay, we have the observed data. We don't know what the variance is going to be, right? Because that's going to be an unseen data. The way to do it is you split your data into two sets, training set and validation set. Okay, you build a model on the training set and you you use the validation set to see what your variance is. So that is considered as a pseudo variance and that you know is your model performance on, on unseen data. And then once you decide based on which model predicts the lowest error on your validation set, you pick that model. That's generally the process. Uh, so and then you have a test set which will run on the algorithm and do it. Okay. The problem, the problem with this approach is that you can have a bad day and you select a validation set which really messes up your, your uh, uh, model. Okay. You pick all the wrong data points, so not all data points are correct, like once you pick only the wrong data points, so you get a wrong model of it. How do you, how do you overcome that? Can you use something like Divide into five sets. Yeah, you do, you do, yeah, so you do five sets or ten sets. You build model using this and you validate on this. You build model on the train set and you validate. You do it for 10 times. For each time, when you, when you, you this is, when I mean test set, you, pre, you build a model, you predict on the test set, you know what the actuals are, you know the variances. For all the 5 or 10 things, so this is called 5 fold cross validation. It's called K fold cross validation. You run the model 10 times on 10 different partitions. You know what the error on each of the things is. You take the average. That's considered my cross-validation error. Okay. 
you can run different models. You can run SVM. You can run logistic regression. You pick the model which has the lowest cross validation score. Okay, that will that's. Harshit is going to talk in detail about this tomorrow. This is uh, one way of doing model validation. You build all the models. I have an output. Which one should I select? So these are the metrics that we will look at. We will look at something called precision, recall, sensitivity, specificity. It tells how how good am I in detecting the true positives? How good is the test is avoiding false alarms? These are good. For example, fraud detection. Is it more important to classify it correctly or wrongly? Okay. Uh, fraud detection. Is it more good to detect to be error on the safe side or be very very strict and tell only if it's correct? I should do. So things like that's very very important. Uh, for example, I'll give an example. Right? You go to a grocery store. They give a coupon, ten dollar coupon. You get a meal. You go. But you, you, it was you didn't get it, but you have that. You, it's already expired, and they scan it. It's already expired. It's always better for them to give you the coupon because it's selling on the safe side than telling that it's not valid because there are chances of you being repeat customers. There. So always depends on your uh, it depends on your actual application. You decide these metrics and tell if it's we call it more important. Precision is more important, which is the way that you should go. Harsha is going to cover. Lot more about this tomorrow, so you know about this. Then some of the things. This is also related to the type one type of that we can take in statistics course. So, uh, so uh, can I say that depending on what the models we are using, what measurements we are doing, we can really manipulate the results. Sometimes. Yes, you can. How do you do that? Uh, good question. So how do you do that? See, this is your objective function. I'm telling you, right? You can define your own objective function. I'm I'm going to minimize my error. I'm I'm writing an algorithm which so my, it's my least square. I'm, I'm this is what I'm telling that I'm going to use least square. You can define your own minimizing algorithm and you can write an algorithm to minimize that. So you can very well do that. That works. That that happens for for in healthcare and a lot of things when the traditional stuff doesn't matter, doesn't work. You go and pick your own uh, uh, metric, and then you write an algorithm which minimizes that metric. Okay, it's it's, it's very common. Even you minimize the cost. It's not necessarily it's a good thing also because it can result into overfitting, which might work. That's why you do cross validation. That's why you do cross validation. When you do cross validation, data is the data seen. You do ten times cross validation. It's not at all ten points of mistake. All ten sets of mistake, right? You don't do. So you have hundred thousand records, so you have ten thousand records in each of the things. Not every ten thousand is mistake, right? I'm assuming that you have at least good data. I mean, at least eighty percent good data. If you have twenty percent good data, then then I mean, come on, that's always a challenge. Then then it becomes a data problem. That's not a algorithmic challenge. So, if you have a large scale, yeah, that's what we do. So, you are telling that I'm doing a black box model, but then where is the big picture in mind? What do you do? So, what you're telling is I'm going to fit a black box model. I have absolutely no idea about what the business sense is. Okay. So yeah, good point. There are uh, that's something which I didn't cover, but there are reasons why for certain class of problems, certain algorithms are better. And that's something that we should look at. For example, we talk about bias variance. So there are things that you want to consider when, when you select which algorithm. So that's the same thing. Okay. Okay. We we'll talk about the. So we now we talked about logistic regression, linear regression kind of stuff. This is another paradigm of how something can be done. Decision trees. You want to play cricket or not? 
can look into all the forecasters, you can look into humidity, you can look into windy, all the climate and then you can decide how you want to do that. Okay. This is a very naive, easy way of doing it. It's very easy to represent. If someone asks you how something is being done, uh, this is what people used to do previously. It used to be a very, very popular stuff. The biggest problem here is, I'm, I'm splitting it based on outlook. This is my first variable that I'm, I'm splitting it on. If my data is wrong, if it's messed up, or if it doesn't come in my test data set, my model becomes very unstable. It's very, the stability becomes a big issue. Uh, this is not this, that big issue in linear logistic regression because we have all the problems and it's all equally, it's all weighted in the same equation. But here, it's hierarchical, right? So you need to go this and then you need to go, so then it becomes complicated. So that's a problem with efficient is. How do you overcome that? Of course, people have figured out how to overcome that. That's the concept of bagging and boosting. Uh, now, with boosting first, boosting is help to reduce bias. What it does is it takes a set of weak learners, uh, learner, I mean, individually, that doesn't tell much about your model, <coughs> tell much about your data. But then you combine all those things together to form one strong classifier. The way you do it is you use decision trees, you use a lot of decision trees and then combine them to create one single strong classifier or combination of strong classifiers and then they will give and then predict the output. A very similar approach is something called bootstrap aggregation. We have 100,000 records. I am going to do a bootstrap. What bootstrap does is you are going to pick sample, I am going to take 80,000 samples at a time. It means that when you bootstrap, it means that you are going to take samples with replacement. You take one sample and again you have 80,000, you can pick another one. You have another 80,000, you can take the same, so you can. So you pick sample like that and you create a model. You create a decision tree. The thing is, you build hundreds of decision trees like that. And then once you have all the decision trees, everything would have uh, given uh, a, some probability, some classification. And then you take count of what classification comes the most and you use that as your output. Okay, So that's something called model averaging. So one classifier can tell A, A, A and then all the others can tell B. So whichever comes most, you use that as your output. So that's called uh, bagging. Uh, it's said to you know, reduce variance. A very, very, very related stuff is random forest which uses bagging. The only thing which, it's, it's, it's exactly bagging, the only thing it additionally imposes is random selection of split. So when we, when we talk about this, one decision tree outlook can be the first split. In another decision tree, windy can be the first split. And then the model goes. This way you can have different uh, decision trees, different outputs, and then when you build like thousands of trees, you take again model averaging and we can get. And, uh, the, and the choice of that feature is again very kind of right? So you would use so for different data sets you would get a different different data sets you will get different no, outputs. Yeah. I mean it's still that data set, right? So, so this random sample Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's the thing. So because you're doing it over multiple things, you it assumes that your variance gets reduced because it's the same process. Mm -hmm. And uh, so generally you would use about eight so it uses boosting as well. It doesn't use boosting, no boosting here. Okay. What is boosting? So boosting, boosting uses boosting as, so both are called ensemble techniques, okay. Yeah. These techniques have been around for many years. They become very popular after the Netflix competition, okay. Netflix competition was won by combination of these techniques. Okay, to your question, boosting uses top to create a strong classifier. Here, no new classifiers are formed. It's the same classifier. Okay. So if you look into it, it it, it, it merges the columns to create one classifier. You can so what, what so boosting what it does, it multiplies inherently. You can, you can multiply. You can we, we will talk about when you get to the code. You can tell what the interaction depth could be. I can tell that I'm, my uh, my classifier could multiply sunny outlook sunny with humidity greater than seventy. I can I can get into that level of detail. In, in bagging, what you do, every variable is separate and then you try to find the split based on uh, what. Here in random forest, you don't have all the variables in picture. Say for example, you get only 70% of the variables, it's randomly selected by the model. 
and then when you have that in the 70 percent which is the most important one it takes all those things the the reason why it performs better is all those uh, noise uh, features are eliminated finally because 70 percent of the data is still using is accurate data and you would get a better model than what you would get from other mm -hmm. other places uh, in, in many 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 applications currently in, in all the things that I currently work with this is considered state of art okay so in industry we I mean traditional marketing all the stuff this is considered state of art for for doing it <coughs> and, and if you go to speech vision deep learning is considered state of art so these are two two techniques which currently is performing better than every other known technique. Um, I don't know how many of you know, but Kaggle is an online platform where, uh, which hosts machine learning competitions. <coughs> Invariably, in the last two years, most of the competitions have been won either by deep learning or by random forest. So, two things. Extremely powerful. Okay. So more than 50% of the winners uh, use R. I mean, it's, it's, it's Python, R, these are the two things that you have to use. Even Python is, is very good. Yeah. Uh, I, I can tell a lot of advantages of Python over R. Uh, for example, it does it, so R is running run entirely on memory. That's always a big problem. Uh, Python Python allows you to serialize objects, and it, it yeah. it's better when but you handle a large amount of data. But in so, scale, uh, if it's that Kaggle is running, you are able to use a cluster. So it doesn't really matter at that scale because you will have enough RAM or not. Well, if you, if you do it on AWS, it doesn't matter, but you, you're, 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 you still pay money for your cluster, right? If you have your own cluster, then yes, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I, I personally feel random forest implementation in Python is better, it gives me better results than R. I don't know why. Even though the, the authors of uh, random forests have done the code in R. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, these are practical challenges. I don't know what point. This is the last algorithm that we'll look at. It's the most simplest of everything. <coughs> Forget all concepts. I, I have a point. I, I talk to my K and ERS neighbors. I'll find what their class is. And my class is there. Okay. It's it's very easy. My nearest people are these people. So whatever they tell, I'll, I'll agree. Okay. It's, it's as simple as that. The most name easiest way of doing. Um, you just form clusters and then, and then you, you do it. But again, the problem is you could end up in, in a place where all your neighbors are messed up data and so your prediction is wrong. That's a problem, but, but the easiest, most simplest stuff to implement. Almost everyone will never use it. The neighbor itself would be subjective, right? I mean, the neighbor himself is... Yeah, yeah, I mean, so you could you could use any number of... You can tell, I'm going to ask five neighbors, I'm going to ask ten neighbors, I'm going to ask two neighbors, I'm going to ask one neighbor, you can do any, any of this stuff. And, and the one thing is, you can de define how the measure is. What do you define by neighbor? So that's something that you can define. It could be a Euclidean distance, you could do whatever that you want. Oh, we didn't talk about this. So, so okay. So we talked about why transformation is needed, right? So we have this data. Okay, this is not linearly classified. You cannot run a linear model in this space. See, we, I know that this is def definitely different from that because I can draw a circle and I can find it. But you can see that any linear way, I'm going to have a lot of uh, misclassifications. But when I when I transform it into uh, uh, into the square dimension, I can clearly find differences. Okay. So this is done this is in kernels. It's the way it's done using kernel it's, it's the theory of it is not easily explainable. It's, it's a it's a session on its own. It uses something called commerce optimization. I don't know if you get to that. Support vector machines does the same stuff. You have data I know that it's linearly classifiable, but I can see four lines. Which one should I select? Uh, support vector machine tells that you should select the line which is which has the maximum margin between between these two. Okay, so you have you have a variable to specify what can be your margin or error, and that would be how it, you would you would select 
you select a line, a plane it's called, between between the points. Uh, that's that's basically so. The, so the, the so this is a plane, the ideal ideal plane, and there are two things which goes which cuts the nearest point. They are called that distance is called the margin, and that's they are called the support vectors, which the vector here and here which passes through the opposing cla classification points. Uh, it's done it's done using optimization. Uh, there's a problem with support vector machines in that uh, when you have a lot of data, a lot of features, uh, it takes forever to optimize. It's not a good idea to do because it, it does it does optimize on that. Uh, the advantage is, is that it can transform it into any into a very 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 infinite dimensional space, and it can find accurate uh, differences. So it used to be very good uh, until a few years back when. When you, you didn't have a lot of data, you can put data into memory and you can you can easily find the best model using support vector machines. Uh, okay, so we would just two minutes and then we'll get back to code. There's some things that you should know that uh, don't kill the data, don't make it confuse. If you fit all kind of models, one model will still be good. So always use your brain, don't lose the big picture. Um, again, you can you can you can complicate stuff. You can build too complex model. Uh, these are these are problems. You, you can you can you will you will think that this model is better or this is the, how the data should be. So you can have your own bias or the data. Not all the data is correct. Model specification could be wrong. <laughs> You might talk, when you do cross validation, you might actually use the validation data to build the model. That will, then, then your data, you're snooping the data. Your model will still not be fine. There have been many classic examples of why data snooping can result in very bad out of sample performance. Okay. Um, do you know the story behind that? About? Is this story behind This story? You really want to know? Okay. Anyone wants to hear this story? Okay, this is a selection bias. Okay, this is about how you do the data. So when you talk about cross validation, one data can be really messed up. This is an example of that. So, so Truman and Debbie were uh, were fighting U.S. presidential elections. This was 40 or 52. I don't remember. Okay, so look under the date. I don't exactly remember. Okay. So, this newspaper, Chicago Daily Tribune. With what do, after polls and what do people do? Exit polls, right? How do you do exit polls? You, you call people and you find, right? And you don't pay money. You pay money before vote. After vote, you just call and find out. <laughs> so uh, you call and then they took a survey and then the next day headlines it comes with a headline that DV defeats Truman. Okay, it was nineteen forty or fifty two. Next day, votes were counted. Truman won very comfortably. He won. Okay, and he flounced it in his uh, acceptance speech that you know <laughs> that I have won. Okay. Now, how can so this is very sound statistical model? Okay, I mean, even in 1950s, stat, statistics didn't change much. Even then, it was very very sound. They did the right stuff. All their inferences, everything was right. What was the mistake? Wrong sample. Sample. Why? Biased sample. Why? It's biased sample. Why? There should be a variation how you pick the sample. No, it's biased sample because they call people only who had telephones. 1940 telephone was not very popular. Okay, which means that people who had phones definitely voted for Devi, but they were not the ones. They were very less minority. So they didn't. So your point is right. So they didn't pick. The right sample of the proportion of stuff, and so the output got messed up. So it's very important that when you have data, you do the right sampling technique. You know, uh, will so our, our the sample data that we work with is something like this. Okay, it's very common in practice. For example, even for anything that you take, the positives are generally very very limited. Number of people defaulting will always be less. Number of people committing fraud is very less compared to people who do transactions. I mean, you can number of people who click on an email advertisement compared to the number of emails it sent. 
you don't even know the scale. It's about billion to hundred thousand. Okay, it's it's point zero 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 two something like that. It's it's infinitely small number, and that's the number which companies like Facebook, Google are working on. If you can even increase it by point zero 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 one percentage, it transforms into millions of dollars. Okay, so you, the, the aim is to ensure how you can increase that particular uh, proportion of some email that's sent. How do people click? How do you detect fraud? When you do so, that's that's the thing that when you do that. Okay, I'll, I'll give an example, right? You have uh, 96 people did right right transaction. Four people committed fraud. So you have 100. You have 96 people committing right transaction. Four people committing fraud. I am fitting a model which tells that all 100 people are right. What is the accuracy of my model? 96 percentage. Okay. Even without doing anything, I can get a 96% accurate model. And in and in web traffic, it's like 99 point something. So it's very easy to tell that you know I can fit a very good model. But but we know that how wrong that can be. That that's why selection is very important. So we uh, use something called stratification of your uh, output. You stratify your uh, your uh, target uh, uh, features in a in a way that when you create all these cross validation stuff. The distribution remains the same. That's why when, when we use uh, sample or random, it always ensures that your your distribution is the same as your as your target stuff. If it's not, then then you're going to really get messed up. So uh, it can happen that I have only four, I have four, right? I do tenfold cross validation. If all four are in the one model, nine models are going to tell that it's correct. The tenth model is going to tell the other way. Model averaging, what happens? Your nine models win. So you're still going to end up with wrong models. Always keep this in mind. Mm -hmm. When something doesn't matter, then you know where all problems can occur in any of these places. So, just one quick question. So, if you have a kind of a very skewed kind of distribution, you have a quantum set of labels of very small You downsample? No, so you do something called oversample. Okay. So, instead of taking all your data, you take uh, all your negative samples and you take some of your thing and you will keep running this lot of time. That's the concept called uh, bootstrapping. Okay, you run the model, uh, instead of running it once, you run it like thousand times and see what my average accuracy is. That's over sampling is, is one way that we do it. The other thing what I told you is stratify. When you create models, you ensure that everything, uh, all the cross all the validation sets have the same proportion so that you get, which is probably how your actual, uh, in real life, that's how it's going to be. So that's another thing that we do. So, I mean, there are other things you can, this, there could be an important variable which we can consider, um, should is consider black box versus white box mode. Decision tree is white box, it's easy to expect. Sometimes, you might want to showcase to your VP, then uh, using something simpler might tell. In some things it may be probably very essential. For example, to identify whether someone is a terrorist or not, it doesn't matter what technique you use, you should be able to identify. Then you do something. Neural networks is a black box model, you really don't know what's happening. Um, yeah, I used to go in banks, adherence to regulations, the fourth step, you know. Regulation, adherence to regulation is very important. You cannot use black boxes at the table. So, consider all those things. So, now, you know, for, then we get back to hands off. Any questions? Did I, did I, yeah, yeah, so gradient, that's boosting, right? Boost, gradient boosting machines is, is a boosting algorithm. It uses, it uses boosting. It, it combines many weak classifiers into strong classifiers and then tries to output. The way it does, it does many decision trees. It can. Yeah, so, yeah, correct. That's a good point. Yeah, so, that's right. So, even in boost, see, I'm just talking about the high class of algorithms. The way boosting can be done using, there are many algorithms within boosting which can. Gradient boosting machine is one. Ada boost is, uh, is the first boosting algorithm. Uh, gradient boosting algorithm machine is what uh, is considered the state of art in boosting country. It uses many decision trees. It builds weak classic weak models, and then it tries to merge 
into creating into some ensemble way, which is which can minimize your variance. That's what it does. And there is also a reference to Card C R E and P H I. Oh, we'll talk after. I mean, they're they're all outdated ones. So uh, I'll suggest to use random calls. Card is classification and regression tree. It's the same as decision tree. It, it all varies in how you spin. So, CART and CHAID differ in how you specify, how you select your. Uh, I, I I showed the cricket example, right? Which class, which is the first uh, classifier to select? That's the thing which it varies. Like when we test classification problems, then we. Yeah. So, decision is very simple. So. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of bias where it come to random calls. Everything, it doesn't matter. Classification, this is classification, it can be anything. It can, it will work even for right spring, you know, dogs and cats. It doesn't matter. As long as you have features, it can classify. It may not be state of art, that's the only thing. These are classification. I mean, these are pretty much the major classification algorithms that's used. Uh, the only thing which I didn't cover, which is state of art, is neural networks. But everything else, for all practical purposes, this would be. Yeah, people use SVM. It has nice uh, mathematical properties. So people do use SVM, yes. It, it works well. It works well when your data size is not large. So for 150,000, you can, you can run SVM. When we actually run the code, you would see SVM takes more time than any of the other stuff because it actually tries to optimize and find the the perfect uh, margin. So that's uh, it doesn't for all the other things. You just need to find uh, difference. So here it tries to find something like that. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay, now now we are going to try it. Okay, I'm going to so this is how you write a function. Okay. The first thing that we are going to do is cap the outliers. Uh, we saw that income had outliers. So I'm going to cap it at uh, one percentage and ten percentage. So you write a function. Quantile will give me the percentile. I'm taking the first percentile and ninth ninth percentile. If that value is less than the first percentile, I'm setting it to the first percentile value. If it's more than the ninth ninth percentile, I'm setting it at the ninth ninth percentile value. Okay. So. I'm, so I have missing values. I have missing values. So we will handle missing values after this. Before we fix this missing value, before we fix missing values, I'm going to set uh, cap the outliers. Okay. First, you handle the outliers. You do this. I'm just I'm just written a function. The way you do this. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Yes. So now, uh, so, so before we do that, we will find. So this is for age. For age, 109 is the maximum. Okay. So, the first person is 24, so we are trying to have all the ages between 24 and 87. Okay, so I, I, so I'm replacing train with this function. Okay, so all it does is if it's less than that. And you do the same thing for test two. Okay. So whenever you do something in train, you do in test also. It should be exactly similar. Whatever transformations that you do, it should be similar. What's the next thing? So you are actually flipping the data 
for age. Yeah, when you tell cap, when you tell cap, that's what you do. You have you have eight layers. I mean, see, hundred and nine. So hundred and nine, I'm setting everything to eighty seven. I mean, it's very arbitrary. I'm not doing any. I mean, depends on your application. I'm just showing what you should do. Uh, I just picked age as an example. You can. It may not be right for. I don't know. And so then, if you are capping the train at eighty seven. Yeah, the test also at 87th place. You can only again calculate 99% time for test in the chapter. Ah, good point. Okay, so there are uh, there are two different. Uh, uh, I mean, there are two different approaches that that people do. Uh, okay, so the the way it has to be done, the actual way it has to be done is the the value at which you cap at the for the train is the same value you should use for test. Okay. So, for sake of easiness, I'm doing it. It's sloppy. Uh, you're right. We should we should use. It should basically be the same as 87 and 24. Okay. Right. You get new data. You get one record. You don't have to get data than 87 and you capture it. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So so do you, do you get this question? No. So maybe we we should do that even before we split it into train and test. What? Oh, we shouldn't do that. Then it becomes data snooping. Okay, that's what I told. You don't look into what is there in validation. Okay, you handle train and validation separately. When you get your train, you take your train, you find what the capping uh, levels are, and you cap it and apply the same metric to this. And then the sloppy thing which works for now, but then when you actually do, you should always use. Okay. Missing this. Yes. Okay. See, age age runs from zero to hundred and nine. I don't want the age to be zero. I don't want age to be hundred and nine. Instead of it, I am setting it to one percentile and ninety-nine percentile, which comes to twenty-four and eighty-seven. So, so if it's less than twenty-four, I am setting it to twenty-four. If it's more than eighty-seven, I am keeping it eighty-seven. If it's anywhere between, I am leaving it the same. We have to do the same for test also. Okay. I mean, just for sake of. Yeah, but you probably don't have to change the test data. Right? If it is already nine, twenty-four, yeah, yeah. If it's already nine, then you don't need to change the data. Just doing a change. Okay. 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 Yes, we're going to remove the outliers. So you are uh, removing all the ninety-nine percent data and capping it up. Anything above is set to ninety-nine percent. Yes. How did you decide this? Yes. For sake of uh, example, I'll give it here. Okay, the way you do it is, uh, if you remember, I showed a plot of income. I don't know if I have the plot. Yeah, the plot is here, right? You know that the value is here. I know that fifty thousand is 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 wrong. We'll 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 do the same thing. So you you first plot everything. You see the distribution. You see where the outliers are. So here what I did, I took the first percentile, ninety nine percent, twenty four to eighty seven. For credit card default, I thought that that made good sense. That you know someone less than twenty four chances of them having credit card defaulting is less. And more than eighty seven, I don't really care. So I'm just keeping at eighty seven. That may be. Uh, And you apply a big picture to our you, you apply a business logic to do. Okay, uh, if you remember uh, when you do summary of train, you know the two columns are null, right? Which are the two things? Monthly income and the uh, number of dependents. Okay, train. So that's basically six column and eleventh column. They have the thing. So I'm going to tell that. I will create a vector. Let's say missing calls are six column six and column eleven, and then I am going to run this command. So for the missing columns, I told apply command. Apply command. What it does is that it takes the data set, and for every row or column, it tries to apply. Apply the same function. What is the function that we are going to do? We are defining a custom function inside. The function replaces if it's if it's null, it replaces it with the null mean value of that column. 
So we have two columns, monthly income and number of dependents. I am doing it and replacing it here. Okay. So I think this is the, uh, so we can't take units for both of them because one of them is a event variable. Okay, good point. So the other one is, has only 13 different values. So yeah, okay. Shift so the mode possibly. Yeah, so for. Shift the mode and specifically for. I mean, you can experiment. Yeah. You can. That is what we can assume. I mean, that's, um, that's, that's anything. I mean, uh, for the sake of example, I'm using it. Uh, but yes, again, depends on what your application has. Yes, number of dependents, what happens? So now, you get a point, it's telling that it's a numeric variable and then uh, it's, a, it's an integer and then uh, now you have a fraction. So what do you do? Uh, you round it up. Okay. That's what I actually did. So you round it up. So now, you come back to being numeric. Okay. The other thing that we have to do is we have uh, state category as categorical variable. You cannot use categorical variable directly. So we have to do something for, you have to convert them into numerical values. Uh, we call that one hot encoding, various terms to do it. But uh, we have something called, in this library there is a function called Indicator variable, or it creates an indicator matrix. Okay, so let me let me tell you what what it is. Okay. It's right at the top. You have question. You have question on it. Okay, so you go to history. And then this here. So. Where, where were you? Yeah. Let's see for that's the top. Okay. 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 The head of train has basically C C D B C D. Okay. Now we see we created a uh, variable which converts it into Indicator variables. Okay, when it's C, it's 1, all the other 4 are 0. When it is C, same thing, when it is D, D is 1, the other 3 are 0. So basically, you are replacing that with 4 columns, which are that. Okay, so, so basically, you come, you replace train. So C bind basically is concatenating it by columns. So concatenating train, you are removing the 12th column, which is categorical. You are replacing it with this. Okay, so there is a, there's a reason why you should, if there are n categories, you should always use n minus 1 uh, categories. Uh, there is a the reason for that, it becomes uh, full rank and it's, uh, it becomes you can it becomes linear, whatever. You're not supposed to use all of them. So you're going to use only if there are n categories, you're going to use only n minus one columns. You can pick any n minus one of these. So now your train is done. Um, I'm sorry I'm rushing it, but I'm going to do the same stuff for this. Okay? So test, I am going to do the same thing, I am going to replace the values with test and then if people need time to copy the code, can hold on Yeah, but I am not connected to internet. Okay. 
Again, we do the data transformation. So now data is ready. Now we are ready to start with the models. The first model, we will do the logistic regression. Okay. So GRM net is the package. We load the package. And so this is Lasso. Lasso is also called L1 regression. Okay, when uh, this one. I'm going to tell that it's it's binomial. It's only zero one. It's binomial regression. This is my train. Uh, my target is the first column. All the other things are my features. And I need to do a tenfold cross validation. This is for cross validation in code. Uh, what am I trying to minimize? I'm going to maximize my area under curve. Okay. Uh, area under curve. I think Harsh will talk tomorrow. So you, you're basically trying to find uh, get a lot of so you want to maximize your area under curve, lasso, and you type into it. It takes a while. Okay, while well it runs, it will run, run for less than a minute. That's the way we can we can increase the performance of this. Okay, all of us have uh, a multi-core machine, right? We can run, each core can run a fold because we're going to to 10 partitions, once the data set is ready in the RAM, each one, each fold, each cross validation can run in one of the code. So that's one way where uh, we can increase the performance of, of this particular model. It's definitely taking more than a minute. No, you have, you specify, you specify any folds you could I'm doing a 10 fold cross validation. Yeah, yeah, cv.glmnet is a function yeah, yeah, in glmnet package. Yeah. Uh, does it normalize the data internally? Yeah, it standardizes it internally, yes. Okay. If you want to not do it, there is an option to turn it off. Then it will take a longer time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, the other thing is, uh, so you can do a cross validation of this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, you have hundreds of age will be between zero and so this is taking a lot more time. What kind of logs? No, it's not like Java where it doesn't tell anything. If the model has an error, it will tell after it runs. <laughs> okay. I used to think that used to be such a cool feature. Uh, it doesn't really tell tell for this. So that's, uh, that's a challenge. Okay. I don't know if you can see the score at all. I don't think it's... It's not even visible from here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, finally, plan. Okay. So the way. So now, what we have to check when the model is run, we want to find what the cross validation. Uh, what the average cross validations? Okay. How do you do that? I will go and check. See, okay, so I'll, I'll give a brief example explanation of what happens. In, in, in regularization, this does a regularized logistic regression, okay, because it's Lasso, Lasso, right? There's a lambda. We didn't talk about how to select lambda, okay? How is lambda selected? Lambda is selected using cross validation, okay? So it takes a value of 0 0.1. And it goes and runs the model and finds what the uh, lowest cross validation error is. And it keeps doing it with various values of lambda. Ultimately, it picks the lambda which gives the lowest cross validation error. Here, our cross validation error that we select was area under the curve. So it leaves the maximum area under the curve. 
the maximum cross validation error was 73 percent. So, the model is able to predict with good accuracy. So, we can tell that our out of sample performance will be somewhere less than 73 percentage because that was our training error. Are you following this? It's a maximum area under the curve for this model, yes. When we use this model, that's the maximum that we can achieve. So, this is uh, this is the cross validation error, which gives a sense of what our uh, uh, out of sample, the only test data set could be, which means that our test performance is going to be lesser than 73 percentage. That's the accuracy of this model. Any questions? How do you increase the accuracy? Yes, I mean, so fit different models, different feature transformations. That's that's the way you go about doing it, right? So you play with. So I did lasso. You can do uh, uh, rigid regression. You can do elastic integration. This is logistic regression. You can go to random forest. It fits support vector missions. You can do all sort of stuff, and uh, and do that. So you mentioned something about Munchkin. I'm going to do that. Yeah, Munchkin. 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 So, you can do this, load this package. I don't know, I can add it, so we need to install this package. And then, if you direct code, it's telling the permission has 8 cores. So, I'm going to register 7 cores for processing. Now, I'm going to do the same thing. Okay. I'm going to run the same model at the center so it takes well to run. Okay. I am going to time it how much it takes, but what I am going to do is I am going to do, it is exactly the same code that we did above, I just added a couple of stuff, I I, I added my threshold, I gave that parallel is true, so it is going to run, each cross validation is going to run on one of the cores. <coughs> that one took a lot of time, but this one took only 41 seconds. And then the same command that we did. Uh, so, this happens every, uh, every other command that you do. Um, Sorry? Like once you do the register, you see it, then. It, it, uh, I mean, so as long as if that can be parallelized, okay. if there is an option to add a parallel equal to 2 for that algorithm, you can do it. Okay? Not all, all algorithms can be parallelized. So, in, so here, even here, only cross validation can be parallelized. It depends on, on your algorithm if it can be parallelized or not. Okay. This is not even getting into big data stuff. This is just with your laptop. Um, big data stuff is entirely a whole different ball game, its own complications. But this is one way to think about how we can parallelize. The way you start about doing this, you write an algorithm, how can we parallelize so that we can take advantages of the performance. 73 percent, now it went to 73 percent. Okay. So, it, it shows some advantages. I, because I changed my threshold, I, I did some couple of changes, iterations and thresholds, and now we have 73 percentage. So, you can work, you can, so, as a homework, you can write changing uh, wherever alpha value, okay, and then you can see how the model improves. So now I want to predict. So now we have test, right? I'm going to predict on the test. My test data set. I'm going to predict, and I need class. So there are two things I can do. I can I can either have probabilities here, or I can do class. I've done class, and then we'll compute all the metrics that we talked about. Okay. So we talked about precision. This is the course of precision.
our predictions are zero. Okay, uh, this model is turned out to be really bad. Okay, this, this didn't work because all the predictions were zero. So you're telling it no one will default. But if you have it, then you're going to get. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to use the DOMC that you used. Yeah. So I'm trying to install DOMC. It's saying package DOMC not available for R version 3.1.1. Which R version do you use? No, 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 I have no idea. I'm no, it's second plan. It's not I'm available. using 3.1.0, so yeah. I never upgrade or whenever the version comes. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that's what I told in the beginning itself. Okay. We will talk a little about decision trees. Okay, so you have decision tree. It's something called art part, but, but uh, I mean the codes are very straightforward. Once you know the algorithm, it's almost say you will call the you will install the package, you will call the package, you will call the function, you will give what the da what the data set is, and then you will tell what you want to predict or optimize. It's 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 constant all over. Okay, it's uh, those are the easier things to do. The same thing you will want to do random forest instead of art part, you will tell random forest will tell what it is it's um, it's exactly it's kind of so this is classification tree decision tree it just used two two roads and it just did two splits and did it and it had an error because it was it's got some really good error. And CP basically is complexity parameter. Wow. So if, if it adds, it, it, it creates a new branch only if it improves the performance, if it reduces the error. Uh, with just two, after adding two, it didn't, it couldn't find another split which reduced the error. So it stopped at that. That's what the plot is. This will tell you exactly how it went about the error. So this is one of the reasons why people use decision trees. Okay. It's very, very robust. Uh, it talks about what variable importance was it, what's the first node it considered, uh, and what was the last percentage, what's the confusion matrix, and then what are the splits it considered. And once you have it, it went to the other code. It does the same stuff, and when it comes to the Third split, it couldn't find anything better, and so it stopped. Okay. We'll do the same thing for random forest. Let's see that it's in stuff. So, again, random forest model for your, uh, your, tra your training features, your target, and how many trees you want to pick. Remember, it's basically you're fitting many trees. And finding what the average is. So, how many features does it change for each feature? Each feature is random, right? Number of features. Number of features it picks at random, yes. That's it's randomized. It's randomized, but it's a number of those numbers. How many features? C, okay, no. It's only, okay, see, okay, the first split, there are 15 important features. There are 1000 features, it picks the top 15 features. And randomly across all the trees, it picks one of the 15. Okay, okay. that's the way it does. So it, it picks what's the, you can optimize it, you can run how much should be selected each level. Okay. So this is the decision tree. As the number of trees grew, your error kept dropping. Okay. And you can predict, it's, it's always the same stuff. I'm trying to see this. 
I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll share the code for this. This one thing I didn't talk about. Okay. See, I'll, I'll show you how we can do some. See, okay, I'm going to take a cross product of, I'm going to multiply each feature with all, all the other features. So you have 14 features in my train, okay, 14 features. I'm going to multiply everything, so I'm going to do a 14 choose 2. And I'm going to add it with the train, that's what I'm going to do here. This what it does, so you can get. Okay, so now we have, we have, if you look into this particular data set, it's got, it's got, I think 92, yeah, it's 120,000 with 92 columns. So I, I took 14, each record I multiplied with all the other 30. I take the second and I multiply with all the other stuff. Okay, I added features. We talked about adding additional features, right? Now we can add additional features. Okay. I will, Okay, uh, there are three features which doesn't have, uh, which is all zero. I know that because we've already done it. I, I, when I share the code, you can look into it. So we are now running principal components on it. It's very easy. Again, call the function and uh, what it is. So the code is extremely straightforward. Uh, it's always the same, it's all very similar to everything. You just need to know what, what it is. I wanted to show principal complex because of this. Okay. So there were 92 things. I, I removed three columns because there were zero, so 89 columns. And it's still in, this is something that we have to look at what principal component does. It's telling that my first principal component is able to explain 15% of the variance in my data. Second principal component, 7%, totally 23%. So you will keep, generally do it until it's like 99% of the variance. Okay, so maybe you will take about 50, the 50 columns to as a feature. So you will you will you will take you will, you will run principal components on your data. You will take the first 50 columns and use that as a feature for your logistic regression or random forest, any of those things. So that's fed to the next. Uh, this. <coughs> For sort classification, they, 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 yeah, you can multiply the square and the square. And the I mean, it's, it's endless. What I told us, you're complicating your model. You're increasing your model complexity. So when you do that, your variance goes up. Does it really help in getting better out of sample performance? Can you get better cross validation score? If you can do that, that means that your model is getting better. That's the only thing. We don't know beforehand. So it's all trial and error. We keep doing it until we get better more. Now, Okay, we are out of time, so I have to stop. Is there any questions? I'll share the code. I know that all of you are lost with uh, a little <laughs> frustrated with uh, what's happening around. Uh, no, it's all not perfect. I can see in everyone's face. So I'll, I'll share the code and then you can look into it. I'll, say, I'll, I'll share it uh, right now. <laughs> now we know that <laughs> it's the third, fourth time. Yeah, so that's why. Uh, 
See, R runs entirely in memory. Okay. So, the big data is something which doesn't fit into the memory. You have a lot of data. You need to figure out how to parallelize various operations. It has its own set of algorithms. It cannot be run on desktop. You can run it only on a cluster setup. So, you need AWS to do that. Oh. This, this is a company called Revolution Analytics, which, which specializes in building algorithms for it. So what kind of data science do you use? I deal with. So what do you use R for? I mean, for for all the things. You know, we just we just predicted default, right? So you can, you can do. So I mean, what are the kind of tasks that you use when you all of those? I mean, <coughs> to build model, you take so it's it's got very good uh, graphical uh, use. You say there's a there's a library called ggplot2, which is very good for. Uh, data analysis. So Use for data analysis. Uh, yeah, so you creating all the plots. You can have better uh, prediction models. It's used widely in academia. So any new technique that comes in the market, it's there now. So you use exclusively. Use extensively, not exclusively. Yeah. Even Python is very good. What is the size of the data Anything which fits into the memory you can do. Yeah. <laughs> Let's how, how popular is R Hadoop? R Hadoop. How popular is it? I mean, it's it's being people are starting to use, but then, but then the thing is there are other, uh, for example, Apache Spark, and it's it's a very uh, it's a new paradigm which is doing better, showing better results than what R Hadoop does. I mean, it's, it's, these are all computing, computing systems. Machine learning for, uh, okay. I'll tell you the biggest challenge for big data, machine learning for big data is, if you look into all the things, you need all the data to optimize it, right? We talked about uh, supervised algorithm, unsupervised, you need all the data to, to do it. So, once, when, the thing is, when you have big data, you cannot have all the data together. It's all to the cluster. You need to come up with, Algorithms which can, which can work in, in a distributed setup, and that's been a challenge. And that's something which a lot of companies are working on. What kind of task for which you have not used R and you use something else and not that? If it doesn't fit into the memory, then I mean it's. Is that the only thing that you have used? Something else? No, I mean for example, text processing. Python is better. Between R and Python, I think it covers most of the stuff. You can take this up later. Any other questions or risks with capital? In terms of classification techniques, uh, you know, which techniques work or don't work when you have more than two of them? No, all of them have options. Even support vector machines, logistic regression, they all work multinomial. You can do multinomial stuff. Taking random forest and all works? Yeah, yeah, it works, it works, it works very well. That's something we use very extensively in industry. It works very well. Okay, I think, I think we are done, we'll close.